checklist. If you do not, would you be kind enough to uh, just raise your hand? We'll get one to you. There's a few right over here. We've got some uh, checklist hander outers that'll be right to you. I said that. There we are. While they're doing that, I'll go ahead and get started. Uh, my name is Jim Caps. I'll be uh, uh, part of the presentation today. Jay Klinkerman, uh, one of our market managers, will be uh, part of this as well. But I wanted to get a, one of the things out of the way before we get into formal introductions, and that is, again, my name is, is Jim Caps, and I work for Dexter Axle Company. And uh, just to clear things up, if there is another person here named Jim Caps, it's probably odd that that would happen, but I just want to, would they stand up? <laughs> Jim, Jim Caps with Caps Trailer Sales, promise. No, no. Uh, just a little bit, uh, I've been with Dexter uh, almost 27 years. Uh, I'm a senior sales engineer. I currently call on, uh, I have a territory of seven states, basically in the Mid-South. Kentucky, Tennessee, Missouri, Mississippi, Alabama, Louisiana, Arkansas, that's seven. Uh, and uh, I've covered that for these years. Uh, I really enjoy what I do and to meet folks. And, and to be able to do something like this makes it a little special uh, because I look at it this way. We're, we're, we're all in this together if you think about it. And we, we are here to support you. Uh, I want to introduce Jay Klinkerman. Jay has been with Dexter uh, a little over three years. He's got uh, 18 years' experience, though, in the trailer industry. Uh, Jay is our market manager for, uh, for Dexter now, and uh, uh, he, he said he was, after previously traveling uh, the southern plains, the mountain west, and the southwest as a sales engineer for Dexter, uh, then he came into our corporate offices as a market manager. And, and Jay brings a lot to the table for us at Dexter as far as hands-on knowledge, and he'll be able to speak to you uh, today and relate a lot of things that we think is going to help you and what you do. Uh, again, he's, a, I guess, a native Colorado. You got it. Uh, that's Coloradian or Colorado. Colorado. Anyway, he's from Colorado originally. So uh, we, uh, we want to get this started, but we just wanted to introduce ourselves to you. Uh, uh, before we get uh, uh, diving in real deep, uh, we do want to take an opportunity to uh, thank the folks at Kurt and thank the, the folks at B&W, and I was looking at, uh, looks like we've got, yeah, we got about 12 minutes left uh, for our part of the presentation, so uh, 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 we want to be sure we thank them, and we're going to give away this Subaru that won't start, <laughs> <laughs> so uh, we'll get everybody's name in the hat, and then you're going to go, I don't know how you're going to get it out of here, uh, because the battery's dead, but... Uh, and Jim, while we're on that subject with Kurt and B&W, um, from my years working and my father's trailer business in Colorado, there's one tool that he used on installing hitches that's pretty simple and will probably help you with your knees. I noticed when they were installing that hitch, they were balancing it on their knees and they're laying on their back. And how many of you have been in that position and telephone rings? Been there, done that. Somebody walks by and you move real quick and you bump your head, now everything falls down. So one of the tools that my dad built, how many of you are familiar with the rack and pinion jack that Bulldog makes? So if you take that jack and that head, weld onto that head a piece of two inch square tubing. And if you do that and then weld the bottom, you know, take the wheel off, what, make you a nice platform so it doesn't tip, and make sure it doesn't tip with weight on it. You want to make sure it's stable with that hitch on there. Then you can actually jack that hitch up to the frame, and you're not having to balance yourself. It's a pretty simple fix, one that we used for many, many years, and my dad being as scotch as he was, he uh, took one that customer bent part of the leg and just cut off that bent part, and it worked just great for us. So that's just one of the tips I wanted to tail in on with B&W and Kurt. Uh, as we move along, I just want to, uh, to, to again, uh, we can't say this enough, and that is to thank the NATDA 
and, and what they do and what they've uh, done for us. And to ask us to uh, be a part of this today, uh, it means a lot to us. This is our third year uh, to be able to do this. Uh, we want to thank the folks that are in our trailers out of Michigan. Uh, they worked with us on some trailer design, and uh, for this, particularly for this, uh, this event. And uh, we also want to thank you for being here because this gives us the opportunity to hear what you have to say and get your input on, on what makes what we can do better at Dexter to make things better for you and to improve your revenue streams and to improve the efficiency of your operations and uh, all of that. So we just want to, uh, you know, we've been in this 50 years. Dexter Axel has been in this business for 50 years and we are committed and we, uh, we feel like there's a partnership here between uh, the manufacturing of our parts and our trailer uh, and, our, and our axles and, and what you do as far as service centers or what you do as far as in retail sales. Um, we are going to walk through today, a, a, if you will, a multi-point inspection process. And I'm curious, just very quickly, how many of you use something like this? Very small number. I think, it's a, I think it gives you a tool that you can use uh, to go back to your customer after you've made repairs, after you've delivered a trailer, whatever the case may be, and say, this is what we found. I just talked to a gentleman a while ago and said, once before the customer leaves, I have made notes and I provide that to the customer and I say, your tire wear is at this point. You know, your bearings look good. I didn't replace them this time. You know, I did replace the seals. And note all of that on there, okay? It can help, it helps the customer. And, and as Craig said a while ago, you're trying to build that rapport and build some value in what you're providing for your customer. And I think that's, that's something that's a really good, really good tool for you to have. So we have these uh, here today in hard copy. You can go to DexterAxel.com backslash checklist, and you can uh, download those if you would like to. Uh, as we go through the process today of this inspection, uh, Jay is going to provide us some hands-on and, uh, and uh, show us a few things as we, we dive a little deeper into the, uh, into the axle portion of this. And uh, we, uh, we really thank Jay for, for uh, giving us that insight and uh, taking all these years as his shop experience and, and sharing it with you. So we're going to go through this inspection process. Some of this... Uh, most of you will probably know more about this than me, and that is the first one, and that is lights. But all we're saying here is, as you begin the process of inspecting a trailer, one of the things you need to do is look at the lights, the marker lights, your turn signal lights. Uh, if this trailer is equipped with interior lights of some kind, a horse, livestock, whatever the case may be, a cargo trailer, you need to make sure that the, all of the lights are operating and that they're working correctly. Uh, one of the other things is a, a license plate light. There's a lot of states that require you to have a license plate on a trailer. And uh, I'd hate for you to get, for your customer to be pulled over because they did not have the license plate illuminated or whatever the case may be. So uh, just some things that we would, to have you become aware of and as you walk through this inspection process. You've looked at the lights, you're gonna look at the breakaway system. Uh, when testing this breakaway system, you need to you know, always disconnect the plug uh, from the trailer. Uh, the trailer should be elevated. Uh, and then at that time, you wanna pull the uh, breakaway switch. And then that should prevent the, the tires and wheels from rotating as you try to move to rotate those. Uh, the best way to do that is in a shop, of course, and with them elevated. Uh, because uh, that is how uh, the, the DOT would like for that to be done uh, and not where you keep the trailer connected and then pull the plug and then try to drag the trailer. Uh, there's some instances that I've had them that we've heard that they try to do that. But I think for you to know truly if, you're, if, if your breakaway switch and, your, and everything is working, uh, you need to be able to uh, elevate the trailer and then pull the, pull the pin, pull the switch. Uh, again, uh, we just want to walk you through the process, the, the landing gear. Uh, you know, you're, you're looking for anything that would be abnormal. You want to make sure that it operates smoothly. Uh, 
Uh, we're going to use the word greasable a lot today. So if there's any place that would require lubrication, if there's grease zerks, if there's anything that needs to be lubricated, this is the point that you would need to do that. You know, some have gears that may be worn, some of them, but the gears may not be, they may be chipped. You know, there may be a situation where you're going to have to replace that. But again, that is something that you need to be aware of uh, during your inspection process. Uh, drop leg jacks. You need to make sure that that foot moves freely. Uh, the pins that hold the foot should operate very smoothly. You shouldn't see any resistance. Uh, and then look for the signs of wear. Uh, over time, you know how that is. You back into something, you bump something, you've had something in a bind, and now it, it's not moving up and down the way it should. So, again, you need to be aware of these things. A swivel jack, just make sure the mechanism moves freely, uh, and make sure the latch pin isn't bent, and make sure it's, it, it is uh, operating and moving smoothly the way it should be. Okay, now what we're going to do, we're going to check the hitch in the coupler. Uh, there's a multitude of styles and hitches and couplers out there. Uh, we've got some examples to show you uh, uh, up on the screen, and I'm going to ask Jay if he would just take a minute or two to kind of walk us through what those offerings are uh, out there. And I'm sure all of your shins have met one of these at least once in your life. I know I still have the scars. That's why I went and got an office job so they'll heal. But basically up on the top left, you're going to have your lunette or penal eye, penal ring. There's about six different names that they go by. You also have your penal hook. They mate together. Big things on those, make sure that they are not worn. There are some gauges out there. Byers has a really nice gauge set that you can use on the ring itself to see how much wear is actually on that eye and when your customer needs to replace that eye. Your hook as well, you want to make sure that it's not excessively worn and make sure you look at your owner's manuals for the respective brands as to when to replace those hooks. Then we get to your straight couplers. Your straight couplers, we have and within the last 10 years, some new upgrades with them, and it's called the auto latch feature. And that auto latch, it's a very simple pop it up, it latches down, put the pin in, and go. You don't have to fidget with the hitch trying to go down. It makes it a whole lot easier. And then we still have the traditional manual latch bolt-on couplers, and we also have those in weld-on couplers. So just kind of a brief overview of couplers. Here's just kind of a quick video of how easy that that ball just pops right in. You can see I just did that with two fingers. Pretty simple, makes it easy. Anybody can hitch it up and you don't have to use as many four letter words when doing it. Moving through the process of the hitch and the coupler uh, you, you, again, you need to make sure that the latch operates smooth. And nothing's in a bind. If there's any areas that would require lubrication, you would want to you would want to make that uh, part of your checklist and part of your procedure. Um, if the model requires a pin, you need to make sure the pin's in place. Uh, if it's, it does have the pin, make sure the cable isn't frayed. Just some of those little things that that could add up to big things down the road. Uh, check if it's a weld on. Make sure these welds are still in good condition. If it's a bolt on. Make sure all the bolts are tight. There's nothing that looks like it's become loose, it's worn. You want to make sure you make, take advantage of that opportunity uh, to make sure that everything is, is still attached to the tongue and, and that it's uh, not showing any improper wear. A couple of ideas that we have for you on the, uh, uh, as far as something that you could offer the customer. Uh, I know you've seen some of these, and these are coupler locks. Uh, we've just got an example for you up there. And then, of course, what Jay spoke to about the auto latch. Again, th that's just some things that you could recommend to your customer and go, if you, I'm going to have to replace the coupler. By the way, sir, you would want the auto latch, wouldn't you? And try to get that conversation going because you're, you're giving yourself an opportunity to up, give them an upgrade, and it's something that's going to work better for them. I don't know if you've had it, if you towed a trailer very much, how many times you get in, if it's just by yourself, how many times you get in and get out trying to get it dead set over the ball before you can get it latched. 
life's a whole lot easier with an auto latch and then of course any kind of an anti-theft uh, that you would want to put uh, on the hitch on your coupler let's move to uh, surge or, or electric hydraulic actuators we want to uh, again uh, when you're doing your process of inspection, you want to make sure that you look at all the areas on these couplers or all the areas on the actuators. You need to, again, safety chains. Make sure everything is the way it should. Make sure the hooks are not elongated. Uh, again, just a little more attention to detail, I think, is something that really adds value and it makes your rapport with your customer uh, even stronger. Uh, you need to look and see if the fluid in the master cylinder it should be full and there, there shouldn't be any signs of water or any signs of rust. Uh, if you see that reservoir cap, it's looking like it's had seen its better day. That could give you a sign of how much that trailer's being used. It may, may uh, require you to look a little deeper, uh, dig a little deeper and make sure that there's not any contamination uh, that are, uh, that's, that's contaminated the fluid. We do have. I left those over at the booth, but I'll have those ready to go. We, <laughs> <laughs> we have examples of good and bad hydraulic fluid, and if you would like to see those, we would be happy for you to come by booth number 500, and we will show that and share that information with you. I think Jay's going to spend a minute or two here on as far as if you do have to change the fluid, uh, how is the best way to go about that, and he's going to walk us through that. The video that's being demonstrated, you can actually download. This is our video that we have for bleeding brake lines. We did that earlier this year. It's been pretty much a big help with that. When purging your lines, a couple things that you will need to really watch out for. Number one, the first phone call you don't want to have to make to your customer is that you have spilled brake fluid onto the side of their trailer or splash it up onto their boat. Bubbling the paint, destroying the finish on the boat, that's not a call you want to make and can be very costly. So when you're working with brake fluid, just always be cautious. Make sure you have proper disposal means, proper containment when you're draining it, and you'll make your life a whole lot easier. Uh, keep some floor dry kitty litter around. When you're doing that, one of the ways that we did it is use gravity as your friend. Disconnect all your lines. Again, make sure you have proper containments down below. Catch all that fluid. Once gravity takes over and those dr drain out, you can, with some low air pressure, take an air hose. Blow those lines out. Make sure there's no debris obstructing it. Again, can't stress this enough, make sure that you have something to keep any splash from getting into your eyes, getting them onto the trailer, and creating some other issues. So use extreme caution with that. Once everything clears out, use some fresh fluid. Go ahead and start purging your system once you, or filling the system once you have everything put back together. And when your fluid comes back clear, you're ready to go and make sure there's no air bubbles in your system. There's some uh, replacement kits out there that we wanted to bring to your attention. And quickly we'll kind of show the actuation portion of a hydraulic surge actuator. Kind of a nice animation where you can see. You see that okay. As it cycles through here see that compression going back through. Those are your working parts. And we get into the next slide, we'll address this portion right here with the boot and the cylinders, making sure that those are some critical pieces to work with. So on your actuators, again, we're gonna start at the front and we'll work our way to the back. Pretty much already covered the latch mechanism. We won't drill to that too much. Then our next piece, make sure your coupler housing. If your coupler has damage to it on the housing, you know it's not gonna go on the ball. There's risks to it coming off. Again, that's another phone call you don't wanna hear from your customer saying, my trailer came off, 
why wasn't I told that there's damage to that coupler or what can I do? That's, or you don't wanna be on the news either. And our next one is the safety hitch pin. Most couplers should have a safety hitch pin that goes through and that keeps that latch from vibrating or popping off. In this particular model, we have just a hitch pin. Make sure that hitch pin also, the keeper portion of that down over here is also operating and it's not bent. You get to a standard coupler like this, we're talking about the hitch pin. This one actually didn't come with a hitch pin. Master lock provides two purposes on that. One, it keeps your neighbors from borrowing your trailer. However, your customer's neighbors borrowing your trailer is a good money revenue because we all know what neighbors do to our trailers. And the second piece of that is it keeps that latch mechanism from coming back up. Next is your breakaway cables. And on an actuator, you wanna make sure that there's no fray. Where you loop them around, come on, pin. There we go. All right. Back in that where you're looping it back around, really look for some any fray on that. If there is, you need to go ahead and replace that. One other piece that you don't want to do on several types of actuators is if you're checking the breakaway system, if you pull your lever, you actually may have to replace some additional components. When the breakaway is pulled, some models of actuators have clips that are sacrificed, and that's by the design. Once those pins are sacrificed, you gotta tear the whole thing apart and replace those clips. So just kind of a little side note there. Jim mentioned the reservoir cap. Make sure you get a good seal on it. You don't want to introduce moisture and water into the system. That's never a good thing. You also don't want to introduce dirt into the system. So make sure they get a good seal, they're not cracked, and also that creates some vacuum into that system, which is the other reason for, this, for needing a seal. Then your master cylinder. Most of the newer actuators have either an aluminum or a composite master cylinder. The benefit to those two types of master cylinders is less corrosion. Some of your older style actuators may still have a steel master cylinder in them. So you do want to check the inside of that for rust. You don't want rust in the system. You don't want to introduce rust into your system. So if you see the orange or the dark black pitting on the inside of that master cylinder, go ahead and replace that master cylinder. There are some upgrades to where you can go to an aluminum. Sometimes you cannot. Now we'll get to the nuts and bolts, or shall I say the pistons of this operation. If you do have to dive into the actuator itself, things that you need to take a look at. The boot. That pushrod boot has the same function as your reservoir cap. It's to keep dust and dirt out of that master cylinder, out of that piston as it's going back and forth. If that boot has cracked or is torn, go ahead and replace it. That's a pretty easy fix. Then we'll be moving on to the shock absorber, or you also hear it called a dampener. And those, when you check those, you want to make sure that you have tension going both directions. The function of that dampener is not to absorb the shock and then push back. It's to absorb the shock, and then when you pull forward, it's supposed to have tension so that trailer isn't slamming back and forth. If you're getting some slamming back and forth, or sometimes known as bucking, that piece in the shock absorber is likely your culprit. Your secondary culprit is probably gonna be the spring mechanism inside that master cylinder. Again, make sure there's no bends in those components and they're pretty critical to the operation of the actuator. I don't know if this will be, I know if this will be the opportunity for you to, uh, to, if you backed up one slide, if there was an opportunity to, to share with them 
uh, the two pins that are on the end. Uh, I don't know if you've ever uh, had the actuator and decided you were going to take it apart. Yes, and, and there is uh, a trick on the UFP actuators with the pins right here in the front and on the back. And it's more critical on the smaller ones. And this is kind of a trick to keep you from when you tear it apart and when you pull that inner member out of that actuator that you have a bunch of parts laying on the floor. I've been there, done that, said a few words. Go to the hardware store, get your three quarter inch dowel pin. Cut it to the width of the actuator itself, or actually to the inside diameter of that inner member itself. What those dowel pins are going to do is going to hold everything in place while you slide it out, work on that inner member, slide it back in. Saves you a lot of time, a lot of aggravation, and it's a pretty simple fix. I'm talking to what a dollar at uh, Ace Hardware for one of those four foot dowels. Oh, Jim, I'll pop back there. There's one other piece that uh, pops real quick, and that's the backup solenoid. The backup solenoid. That, if it gets boogered up, clogged, it will need to be replaced, but it's also critical to have that solenoid in place if you have a customer with a trailer with disc brakes. If they have disc brakes and try to back that trailer on a surge system on an incline, even with some of the more powerful diesel trucks, you may be able to push it, but you're going to skid tires. And some of them diesel pickups still can't even push them very well. So make sure that's working properly. It works simply off the backup signal of your pickup. That's typically on the five pin flat plug or the seven pin RV plug. Both are wired with that reverse function in those. As you know, the Dexter offers a lot of different types of kits and replacement kits uh, for axles, parts, uh, but we wanted to, to spend just a little bit of time on, uh, on some of the kits that you can buy for, uh, for the actuators. Uh, and the first one there in the illustration is the, uh, the latch replacement kit. Those are available. Uh, you have an emergency cable replacement kit. Uh, those are available. Uh, just the hitch pin kit if you need that. And then again, what Jay was just speaking to as far as the solenoid replacement kit, sometimes you would need those. And those come in, in, in kit form, which would be, uh, in our world, would be the, uh, K, would start with the letter K. We have some more visuals for you as far as uh, brake lines. And after you've inspected this actuator and at this point you're, you're moving to, to look at your brake lines, you know, you want to look at any place that may be leaking, any of the where they're coupled together, uh, if there's anything that looks uh, worn, uh, if there's been any rub on the trailer frame, uh, you just need to make sure that every, there's not any fluid leaking anywhere. Uh, and we've, what we've done is we've, we've kind of given you some illustrations of, of worn. Uh, you can see uh, at, any of, at any point in there that those would need to be replaced. At that point, uh, if it's really and truly, if you think about it this way, if there's any doubt at this point, just replace the lines. Don't, you know, err on the side of safety a little bit. I think your customer would want that. Uh, and, and again, when you provide them with your checklist that you've gone through and you go back in there and you say, here's two pieces of the line that's worn, uh, you've had some leaks, you've had this and this and this, and here's what we've done. We've replaced this for you. Again, I think that just adds value to, to what you're offering. If, if you need to replace the entire uh, uh, actuator rather than just repair parts, uh, there's a couple of things Jay has already spoken to, and one of them is that auto latch that you're going to have to replace. Uh, there's another uh, opportunity for you here is the thermoplastic brake lines. Uh, thermoplastic brake lines offer a, a, a lot of advantages. Uh, a few of them are just the, the ease of installation, uh, very easy to install. Uh, the flexibility of the line is not rigid. It gives you opportunity and the, and the ability uh, to move in areas that you might not be able to uh, with rigid lines. And then, of course, uh, there's an offering there of more uh, resistance to uh, corrosion. Just a few of the things I think that's some benefits to you. And again, you're offering your customer some upgrades here. 
during the inspection process, you're going to have to look at safety chains, uh, make sure that they're properly crossed. Uh, I don't know if you recently have, I was watching Today Show, and it's been a month or so ago. If you saw someone had filmed a camper that began to weave on the road, and it just got worse, and it got worse, and ended up the camper's over, but they, someone made the comment that the safety chains were attached, and that was probably one thing that stopped or helped that it was not uh, a more catastrophic event than what it was. Uh, but if, uh, it's, a, it's a really, really good, uh, compelling video if you've ever seen it. Again, make sure they're crossed. Make sure that they're not dragging. Uh, I, don't, I won't even ask for a show of hands, but how many times have we seen behind someone sparks coming up and you're going, surely they don't have the safety chains dragging on the asphalt going down the interstate. And as you pass it, or as it slows down and you pass it, they sure do. They have safety chains dragging on the ground. Either they're not connected or they've got too much slack in them. Uh, that could greatly compromise uh, the, the effect of what safety chains are designed to do. Uh, again, if they're excessively rusted, if the S-hooks are, are pulled, if they're elongated, that is a time that you need to, to do the, and replace that. When you replace safety chains, there's a lot of things out there that are available. Uh, there's some options. You know, you've got the standard. Uh, you've got things like uh, vinyl coated. Uh, you, there's also a safety cable uh, that you could use as an option. So there, there are a lot of things out there that, that you can, uh, as you can see on the, on the screen, that, that, uh, that you can offer. I'm going to ask uh, Jay to kind of walk us through some of these, uh, some of the guidelines, some of the nomenclature, some of the terms that are used uh, in, in the safety chain as far as the market and, and uh, what's available. If you happen to have a full service shop, you're probably working on not just the trailers that you're selling, but you have customers who are bringing in other trailers that they have. And you may not know how to tell if they have the proper safety chain on the front of their trailer. One of the ways is by the grading of the trailer chain or chain itself. At NACM.info, which is the National Association of Chain Manufacturers, they have set some standards on how chain is supposed to be identified. On the screen, you'll see a G30. That's grade three or grade 30 chain. It also may just have a three, may have a 30, may have 300 on it. In your distributor catalogs, you're also going to see that most of them also designate in their description the different grades. You'll have 30, 43, and 70 are the three most common grades that we see in the trailer industry. With that being said, each ch the chains are supposed to be marked. And roughly about every tenth length, there will be a mark on the flat side. And what's on the screen is what is right here. And so that'll give you an identification of what is there. And those ratings will give you how much weight, both working and breaking weight, that those chains can tolerate. So make sure that if you have a triple axle trailer with 7K axles under it, that they have the proper chain that's going to support what that trailer can haul. They may have just gone to the local hardware store and grabbed a safety chain because that looks good or that's what they had, but it may not be the right one. So just ensure that, and that's just an additional safety feature to bring to your customers. We're moving through this inspection process. You want to spend some time on latches and hinges. Uh, we're just going to briefly touch on that uh, today, but it just it's something that is part of that procedure, and we wanted to emphasize that with you a little bit. You know, you just need to make sure that uh, if, the, if it's a hinge, that all the screws uh, whatever's attaching that are tight. Uh, you need to, if it's a flush mount, make sure it operates properly. Again, you're you're building that rapport, you're building value for that customer when you go to him and he says, "You mean you've even checked the latches? You've even checked the flush mount locks?" That means that you're doing a very thorough ins inspection, and and then you're going to provide the feedback to the customer. And I, and I think it's a, it's something that we uh, we should all follow. Uh, if they do need replaced, uh, you can suggest things, you know, some hardware upgrades or some greasable pins. There's some things out there in the market that, that you could offer to the customer. 
We're going to spend just a few minutes on, uh, on brake controllers. Again, you would need to test a brake controller. There's a lot of brake control test uh, mechanisms out there that you just go to the back of the tow vehicle and plug in, and it's going to tell you what the output is. It's going to give you all the diagnostics uh, that you need. Uh, some brake co controllers require manual uh, leveling, and then some are auto leveling. So you just need to make sure of what type of controller is in, in the tow vehicle. Uh, tire wear. Probably had lots of discussions in this group with lots of people as they're in your shop or they're in your dealership or they come back and the discussion comes back to tire wear. A good rule of thumb is uh, what we've kind of tried and true over the years and that's just use an old Honest Abe and turn him upside down to gauge the tire tread. It is a good visual for you to see and it is a good rule of thumb to tell the customer either you need tires or you're going to need tires someday soon. But it gives you a little bit of a, of a guide and something you can go back again and share with your customer, the end user, uh, whatever that may be. There are in our Dexter uh, maintenance service manuals that we have that I would hope that all of you have at your dealership or if you deliver them, if it's a retail lot that you send these with each trailer. Uh, you can download this information at DexterAxle.com, of course. Um, it gives you tire wear, uh, and it shows you examples of tire wear, and then what may be causing that. It just it kind of leads you kind of in a, in a process, if you will, a process of elimination or maybe a process of identification of what, uh, what may be causing your tire wear. Again, center wear, edge wear, uh, the, the side wear of the tires. Uh, the cupping, there's flat spots. If you got flat spots, you got something locking up and it's scooting your tires. You know, if you're cupped, then you're out of uh, you're out of alignment. Some things like that. So, again, it's in our it's in our uh, service maintenance maintenance manuals. You can access it on our website. Uh, but this just gives you a good idea of uh, uh, of some things that you can do to troubleshoot and maybe help the customer uh, identify what the tire wear is. Yes, sir. I'm glad you asked that. That comes up in a slide just a minute. We'll, we'll, we'll talk about camber in a minute. Thank you. Okay, wheels and tires. Again, overinflation, underinflation, here's some examples for you. Uh, overinflation, you can see that uh, that uh, does not uh, provide the optimum as far as uh, where the rubber meets the road, if you will. Proper inflation, of course, is, is where you have the, the best. Uh, under inflation, again, it's going to cause some tire wear issues. We recommend and we try to emphasize that every time, and, re and emphasize this with your customers, before they leave, check the pressure in their tires. A trailer tire, trailer wheels are totally different than the automotive industry. And trailer tires and trailer wheels are hauling a lot of weight. And that is, uh, it's critical that you maintain uh, proper tire inflation. And of course, that uh, information as far as the proper tire inflation is found on the side wall of the tire, uh, which is the manufacturer's recommendations. Uh, again, uh, get a good tire gauge, have it in the glove box, have it somewhere uh, for the customer. If it's at your shop, make sure you have good, reliable uh, ways of measuring uh, tire pressure. We're going to check uh, the proper lug nut torque. If you've removed the wheels and put them back on, then there's a process that we're going to walk you through in a little bit as far as proper torque. But again, in the, in the process of, of inspection, uh, you need to check that the customer has uh, the proper wheel nut torque on their, on their trailer. Uh, if available, there's some uh, requirements by the manufacturer. I know that Dexter has some labels and some stickers that you've probably seen uh, probably above the wheel well that says recommendations are check your wheel torque, that kind of thing. So uh, if you don't have those labels, if you don't have those decals, we, we suggest that you get those uh, and, and introduce the customer to that. 
Uh, we're going to have Jay step in again here, folks, and he is going to walk us through uh, the proper lug nut torque and, and the, as far as the procedures and how to best to, uh, to do that. As you can see, we got a video here going, going in the traditional star pattern on how to torque your lug nuts. A few things here to make sure you pay attention to is one is going to be your stud size. Your stud size and your wheel size, they go into combination. You know, we're on this particular wheel, it's a 15 inch, five on four and a half bolt pattern, pretty standard, half inch stud. They're going to be torqued in three stages. And the reason for the first stage is simply just to get your wheel and tire onto the hub evenly. That's the first function of that. Section, second function is to snug it up a little bit farther. And that's going to get you at 50 to 60 foot-pounds. And the final stage is going to be between 100 and 120 foot-pounds. That gives you a good snug fit up on that. One other caveat to really pay attention to is there are some wheel manufacturers that may not allow for some of the torques that we call out to be the maximum torque that the stud will receive. So make sure you, in combination with what our stud's maximum capacity is on the torque and the wheel manufacturer's torque and what they can do is where you're going to need to actually torque those wheel studs too. Also down here in the bottom we do, as Jim mentioned, there are some handy dandy little stickers that we can use. And you also notice that there are some times where you need to double check that torque. It's pretty much just like they were doing on this defunct little Subaru, where when you torque it up, the bolt will relax. So at 10 miles, 25, and 50, you want to tell your customers to check that bolt torque. In practice, I personally know that's rarely done. I don't know how many in this room actually do it when they've taken their vehicles into the automotive shops. And if you look at their paperwork, they say very similar language. But I'm not sure how many of us actually do it in practice. So this is what we should be doing and illustrate that to your customers and hopefully it saves them tire wear and catastrophe down the road. Yes, sir. On that, it's going to have to be with both. And unfortunately, since we do not sell tires, I'm not going to cross that line and say which one you actually have to do. So you're going to need to go to the trailer manufacturer, since they built the trailer to their specific design in combination with the tire manufacturer and see what is actually recommended. I'm sure a lot of us remember back in the 90s when Ford and Firestone basically had a divorce because they had some issues with tires. So make sure you go back to the trailer manufacturer and the tire manufacturers and make sure they're mated correctly. My preference would be to use a traditional torque wrench that's periodically calibrated. And that's my personal preference. I've not used the impact click sticks, so I really don't have an opinion for or against. I just know what I have used in the past, and so that would, we're all creatures of habit, so that would probably continue to be my go forward point.
So the question on that one was torque sticks versus traditional torque wrench, in case anybody didn't hear that question. Mr. Jim? All right. I just I was looking at that. It's found in your in the maintenance manual as far as uh, retorquing your wheels at 10, 25, and 50. Share one with you. I uh, have a customer that when he delivers his trailers, when I say delivers, when the customer comes to fix it up, he has a sheet, and, and part of this sign-off process is that they will, he goes out and he shows them, here you have to retorque your wheels, and you need to retorque them at 10, 25, and 50 miles, and periodically thereafter. And he has them sign right here on a piece of paper that they, he has explained that to them, and that they have knowledge that he has explained that to them, and then he has that on his file. Because, as we well know, people will not do that. We're just creatures of habit. We've got the automotive mind. You don't ever retorque your wheels on your car, uh, but it's a totally different application. So you just need to make sure uh, that you emphasize that again. We're going to move to uh, axles and suspensions. A little easier for me to talk to than latches and uh, lights, if you will. During your inspection process, you need to be looking for anything that has worn shackle links, equalizers, bolts. If there's any, uh, any damage to threads, the hangers. And we've got some good examples for you here uh, as far as, and you've probably seen all of these. And you wonder probably how they got the trailer to your shop and the condition that it was in when you look at how the, uh, whether it's the equalizers or the shackle links have, have absolutely worn completely out. Worn equalizers. See that grease zerk on the top? My money says that grease zerk never saw any grease by the way that thing is worn. Rule of thumb here is, if it's got a grease zerk, grease it. We want to share with you uh, some information on the EasyFlex. I don't know if all of you are familiar with that, but that's an EasyFlex suspension system that, that Dexter offers. Uh, what we've done is we've taken two pieces of, of an equalizer and then inside of that, uh, press that rubber in. Uh, that rubber will reduce the stress pushing upward on the trailer frame up to 70%. And you could buy that as an, at the OEM level, which is the, the complete kit that is shown, or you can buy it uh, as an aftermarket, which is just equalizer nuts and bolts. It is four double I springs up to 8,000 pounds. We also have what we call the Dexter heavy duty suspension kit. And I don't know if you've seen those or not, but those shackle links are very robust, a very thick, Heavy shackling. Something, again, to, to offer your customer to say, you pull this trailer a lot, folks, and I'm looking to see, and I'm seeing all of these wear points, and I'm seeing that you've got X number of miles that you've told me that you've got on this trailer. Maybe we need to be looking at upgrading. Maybe we need to be looking at the heavy-duty suspension kit with the more robust hangers, the, I mean, the, the shackle links, and the nuts and bolts that are all greasable. Maybe you want to go to this easy flex suspension. That is something that would reduce the stress on the trailer frame because it's someone that's using that thing all, that using that trailer all the time. You know, you got customers that use the trailer once every two months, and then you've got customers that basically don't ever uh, unhook from the trailer because they're using it all the time. So you've got, you got a wide variety, but again, this offers you something to, 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 to the customer uh, as an upgrade. going to look at let's just we're, we're doing a, a kind of a for instance but if you uh, if the customer has expressed uh, that there's tire wear issues there's a line they think there may be alignment issues and you're going to have to dive in a little deeper uh, then Jay's going to kind of walk us through some of the process uh, of being able to do that uh, I would encourage you to take notes uh, again we welcome your questions uh, but uh, this is something I think is very valuable and we want to kind of uh, walk through this with you so basically, 
your customers come in, they're complaining, complaining about tire wear, and you're trying to figure out what's going on. So one of the first ways to do this is pretty simple. You're going to run your tape measure. And what you want to do is come from the center point of the hitch itself. We basically had a stick that went up into the coupler. We fixed it to the ground, made sure it was in the center of the coupler, and it was plumb, and the trailer was level. The next piece of that is you're going to go from that center point to the center of your axle. And you're going to do that on both sides, which give us our A and our B dimensions. We want to be within a sixteenth of an inch. That's a pretty tight tolerance. And that tolerance, if it happens to be out, is going to give you the symptom of dog tracking, meaning that your trailer is going to be pulling from side to side, or not side to side, but it's going to follow you at an angle. The next piece on that is we want to make sure the axles themselves are pulling parallel with each other. So that dimension is going to be from center of spindle to center of spindle. And that we would like to see within eighth of an inch. Again, it's a fairly tight tolerance, but that's going to be your optimum for pulling those trailers and not seeing excessive tire wear. If you happen to have a triple axle application, you would simply just duplicate this to the axle two and three. If we get beyond that point, then we need to do a, some further investigation if things are not checking out with the dimensions. And with those dimen or with those things that we would be looking at, we're going to be looking at, and I'm going to snag my cheat sheet here real quick. I do apologize. We're still going to be running that tape measure. We're going to be looking at the hangers. I have actually seen some repairs also even from some factories. We, we do know that things get built at 4 o'clock on a Friday afternoon. Things happen. Somebody gets interrupted when they're working on or building the trailer or repairing the trailer. I've seen where the hangers themselves may be out. So we're basically going to duplicate that same process and we're going to go from the center pin and we're going to go to the front hanger, to the, to the bolt, center of the bolt to that front hanger on both sides. We're going to duplicate that just like we went from center of axle to center of axle. So you go to the center hanger and then to the rear hanger. And again, you want those dimensions to be within eighth of an inch. If those check out, then our next thing that we want to look at is our springs. You want to mate your springs to be as close as they can from axle to axle. So, for instance, you have two springs that are measuring 25 and a quarter inches. But you may have two other springs that are measuring 25 and 3 sixteenths of an inch. There is some fluctuation in your springs. So you want to make sure they're mated by pairs and get them as close as you can because that will keep your axles running parallel with each other. Other things to continually look at is going to be wear. If you have components that are worn, like this equalizer, you know, it's sitting up there and it's just flopping around. Guess what? Those axles are not going to pull parallel to each other especially if one side has more wear than the other. So you're looking at some componentry. It's going to be a little bit more intrusive to get in there. Shackles, bushings, they're wearable parts. And if you do a repair, don't let your customer talk you into, oh, it's just this side that's broke. Repair both sides, and your customer will be able to go down the road farther. Just explain to them, it's like, well, you know, I can replace the one side, or I can replace the, the one the one spring where you have worn hardware, but I'm going to see you again next week and you're not going to be happy with me because the other side broke. Everything typically wears together and typically at the same rate. 
So that's a good way to keep your customers happy. Even if they don't see it on the front end, they'll probably see it on the back end. So those are just some tricks and stuff that we used to use as we were looking at alignments. Uh, in the event that you're going to have to, uh, to dive a little deeper uh, and what the gentleman spoke to a while ago about camber, uh, we're going to spend a few minutes on that. And that is, uh, uh, we have a good illustration for you here. Uh, the top one is what we would say is an uncambered axle. And then the bottom would be a cambered axle. Now, the majority of the axles that Dexter manufactures have camber. And that camber is calculated by the length of the axle. And some of you may have had a customer, especially a first-time customer, that comes back and says, my axle's bent, it's got a big hump in the middle of it. It's probably happened to you, hasn't it? That is camber. We do have situations where we do not camber axles. Uh, someone gave the illustration while we were putting this together, uh, a, a drift boat, a flat bottom drift boat. It's the same weight all the time. It's a light duty. It's not going to be used for anything else. So they don't need camber. There are some, like I said, there are some of those uh, applications where you would not need camber. There are some situations where you're going to have negative camber. Of course, that's the customer probably that says, oh, no, we never over overloaded that trailer. We've, uh, we haul styrofoam <laughs> and uh, feather pillows. I'm trying to think something else. Uh, we don't haul wet sand or shingles. <laughs> oh, no, we don't do that. Uh, I've had a rule of thumb for the short 27 years with Dexter. People will put on a trailer what will fit. So that's something I would ask that you take with you today. Well, one more cow will go to the sale barn, won't she? Just one more cow. That's right. Yes, sir. Why does Dexter make a half cambered axle? If it's a half cambered axle, I would say that that is customer specified. From for, the manufacturer? Yes, sir. When I say customer, from the manufacturer, from the OEM. For some reason, they've asked for a half cambered axle. Is that something that you can do with that kind of stuff? No, sir. I mean, we're going to, when they go through the line, we just set the tubing in a certain way and we camber. It's a good idea, though. Maybe we need to add, it's a, I'm sorry, it's an add-on for camber. We just, we just got that today. No, it, it's we either camber them or we don't. So, uh, but it's a good question. Yeah. Uh, it's probably specific to an application uh, to where, uh, Maybe it's a ladder duty application and it's a constant load. So they haul the same thing all the time. You know, it's a, maybe it's a fixed load, maybe it's a generator, or maybe it's a, you know, something of that nature. And in so. a torsion axle, there may also be some cases that come into play. I've seen it in the horse trailer side where you're trying to get the deck of that trailer as low as possible. And so you're trying to adjust as much as you can and so the half camber there may be because the amount of camber that we would consider full camber actually peaks enough to where the floor of the trailer is actually not able to get to where it needs to be as well. So there are some fitment issues with camber and depending on what the OEM has designed that trailer and the function that that trailer is wanting to do, they may request that half camber to get to that point. There could be some situations to where uh, the, the, uh, the axle has lost camber. Uh, there are some alignment shops and some folks out there that can, that can repair that. Uh, but then there are some situations to where uh, that's not going to be feasible and, and then that's in the, uh, to where you would need to replace the axle. Uh, before we move uh, further, Jay's got a, 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 some, uh, some more to add, but I want to I thought I would interject this uh, as far because we're talking about the axle and the axle tube and camber. In our maintenance book, there is an area on the axle that has a serial number. And I don't know how many of you have had to utilize this. But on the axle tube, on the what I would say, if you're standing at the back of the trailer, right of center, rear, most of the time, 
there will be a serial number engraved in that too. That is valuable if you ever have to, to replace an axle, uh, you can contact uh, your, whoever you buy your axles from, whoever you get your parts from, and they can run that serial number and then get you the, and then we can run that in our system and get you uh, the, correct, the correct axle. But again, it's in the back of our manual. It just shows you uh, where that uh, axle identification and what that serial number is, and it's a very valuable tool. So back to torsion axles. I'm sure most of you are wondering, what do I have in my hand? It's not just a fidget stick. It's actually what happens to the rubber cord on the inside of a torsion axle when it is overloaded and worn out. It actually starts to shred itself. So if you happen to see the arm of that torsion axle is starting to creep up, eventually it will wind up doing this. So while a torsion axle is designed to run with load on it, it's not designed to run in overload. And I know a lot of us have seen, and we'll probably see a lot of this now with the Mother Nature getting